Sometime after sunset, a group of men gathered together in Kandahar to savor the moment they made history. Televisions had been banned in Afghanistan, but these men were honored guests. Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda faithful were there to watch the horror of 9-11 unfold. What Al-Qaeda called the Manhattan Raid. So the West invaded Afghanistan. There was a belief it could be done quickly uh, with a very light footprint. Uh, we could be in and we could be out again. And we ended up uh, doing neither one thing nor the other. Instead, 47 nations, America and Britain especially, have been sucked ever deeper into a quagmire. Oh, I used to ask myself every time I went to Afghanistan, what are we doing here? In the first of three programs marking 10 years of war in Afghanistan, I've been examining some of the key decisions that have shaped the conflict. A conflict that's cost many thousands of lives, including more than 370 British servicemen and women. With the right attention, the right strategy, and the right resources, the war would be over and most of our boys would be home. But we didn't do it. It's important to give people a clear idea that there is an end to this. So, will the death of Osama bin Laden, who started the Afghan war, bring us any closer to an end? Two years before 9-11, Afghanistan's UN envoy arrived in New York. There, he handed in his resignation. I went to the Security Council and said, look, I have done everything I know, and it has got us nowhere. I haven't got anywhere because you are not supporting me. You are not interested in Afghanistan. Uh, but you are wrong. Afghanistan had become a pariah state. The Taliban government had allowed al-Qaeda to establish its base there, from where Osama bin Laden had declared a holy war on Jews and Christians. The Taliban shared with al-Qaeda its medieval version of Islam. The United Nations had been trying to persuade the Taliban to kick out al-Qaeda. Their envoy had had a rare meeting with the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar, a veteran of the war against the Russian invaders, of the 1980s. Very shy man. Uh, he had uh, lost an eye, and he was, he was very much aware of that, so he kept you know, always playing with his hand like this. Uh, very, very soft-spoken. I told him, look, you know, this group have an agenda that has nothing to do with, uh, with Afghanistan, and that will create a lot of problems for you. He said, Osama bin Laden, uh, you know, he is our guest. In Afghanistan, bin Laden was more than just a guest. As a wealthy Saudi, he helped bankroll the Taliban regime. Mullah Omar refused to disown his friend and benefactor. Lakhtar Brahimi's mission had failed. He warned the Security Council that by ignoring Afghanistan, they were storing up trouble. You are wrong to think that you know, this is a small country, a faraway country. You know, what happens there is irrelevant. It will blow in, in our faces. The impact of 9-11 cannot be understated. It was the deadliest attack against America in its history. With nearly 3,000 dead, it was inevitable that America would strike back. The people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. Prompting America 
to invade Afghanistan was exactly what Osama bin Laden was hoping for on September 11th. His son has told us, in retrospect, my father's dream was to get America to invade Afghanistan. To me, it's just common sense, though. Obviously, you got to go get the guy. America gave the Taliban every chance to avoid war. All they had to do was hand over bin Laden. If bin Laden's the guy we want, send the assassination team out and get him. It was a serious effort to persuade the Taliban, you do not want to go down with Al-Qaeda. If you'll hand these guys over, uh, our war isn't with you. The Taliban response was that their ancient hospitality code trumped all other considerations. It was a no, uh, that we're not going to separate ourselves from our traditional hospitality and welcoming of guests. It's hard for us to understand that when you're dealing with a, with a man like Osama well, bin happened, Laden. It happened like that. It happened like that. Yes. The life of the guest is protected by the lives of the hosts. Nearly four weeks after 9-11, America's patience ran out. The president told his generals to unleash holy hell. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. America was determined not to get bogged down in Afghanistan, so there was no large ground invasion, no heavy armor. Instead, America relied on CIA operatives, precision, speed, just 1,800 troops, and buying up Afghan militias. Its plan was war light. We sent in 20 or 30 CIA officers with several million dollars in walking around money and bought the Northern Alliance over to our side. The Northern Alliance was a coalition of warlords which had once ruled much of Afghanistan. They were a ragtag militia, now aligned to the world's most sophisticated fighting force. In the 1990s, the Northern Alliance had lost to the Taliban in a civil war costing tens of thousands of lives. The tables were now turning. On the 13th of November 2001, just five weeks after the invasion, the Northern Alliance captured the capital, Kabul. It looked like the war was over. That's not what Osama bin Laden thought was going to happen. He thought it was going to be a long, protracted guerrilla struggle. He was surprised. The celebrations in Kabul concealed a mass of underlying tribal and sectarian tensions. The Northern Alliance represented ethnic groups in the north. The Taliban were drawn from the majority Pashtun of the south. To avoid another inter-ethnic civil war, Afghanistan needed a leader acceptable to both the North and the South. That leader was a Pashtun who teamed up with US Special Forces at a secret airbase near the Pakistan border. His name was Hamid Karzai. In 2001, my mission was to link up with Hamid Karzai I, I liked him immediately. I, I can't say I've worked with uh, many Afghan warlords before, so maybe they're all uh, equally personable. But Karzai was a, uh, a very modest man, uh, very polite. Captain Amarine's mission was to help Karzai raise an army against the Taliban. The Taliban had retreated south and were regrouping for a last stand in their spiritual home in Kandahar. During a chaotic day of fighting, Karzai and Amarine learned that hundreds of Taliban fighters 
were closing in on. Basically, as all hell was breaking loose and we're waiting for the Taliban to overrun our location and kill everybody, uh, Karzai was uh, standing out there in the street, calmly directing people and trying to gather up uh, uh, guerrillas to fight with us. He, he was definitely cool under pressure. We received a phone call late at night. Uh, everybody was asleep except uh, me and Karzai. After he hung up, it, it was like, you know, oh, who is that? Uh, and uh, he says to me, oh, that was an intermediary for Mullah Omar. And it, I kind of did a double take. I'm like, uh, what did Mullah Omar want? The Taliban leader wanted to explore the terms of a surrender. Provided the Taliban returned peacefully to their homes, the war would be over. At least, that's what the Taliban say Hamid Karzai promised Mullah Omar. He promised to him that this is your country, to live in your country peacefully with all your natural rights and the human rights. But they were not allowed to live peacefully in this country. Washington rejected a deal with the Taliban. Their Afghan mission was kill or capture, and they made no distinction between the Taliban and al-Qaeda. Do you think that was a mistake? I do. Certainly below the level of Mullah Omar uh, to have considered a political approach which would have offered the Taliban possibilities to participate in the political process, provided that they would cut their ties with international terrorism. I think that history will judge that a missed opportunity. Because Washington wanted to get in and out of Afghanistan swiftly, there were few US troops to chase the fleeing Al-Qaeda and Taliban leaders. The hunt for Osama bin Laden took special forces to a network of caves close to the Pakistan border. This top hill, the very top up there, that's supposedly where uh, bin Laden's hanging out. The Americans had deployed less than 100 troops with which to seal all routes out of these vast mountains. Bin Laden slipped away, as did the Taliban leaders. We took our eye off the ball and gave Osama bin Laden and Mullah Omar a remarkable second chance. And in one of the most brilliant military comebacks of modern times, the Taliban went from the ashes of defeat to being on the outskirts of Kabul in a matter of less than a decade. Any hope that the Afghan war would be brief vanished when bin Laden and Mullah Omar slipped across the border into Pakistan's Pashtun tribal lands. Greeting the fugitives were not only friends and family, but also elements of Pakistan's military intelligence sympathetic to al-Qaeda and who'd also helped the Taliban win the Afghan civil war in the 1990s. They wanted the government in Kabul that was under their influence and control, and which was not under the influence of India. They had given them their first uh, batch of serious weaponry, uh, ammunition, uh, they, uh, uh, money. There were Pakistani military officers who were working and serving with the Taliban. After 9-11, Pakistan's president, Pervez Musharraf, bowed to American pressure and promised to cut his government's ties to the Taliban. The Bush administration was ecstatic when Musharraf agreed to switch sides after September 11th. President Bush is a man who believes very strongly in personal relationships. And he believed that he and General Musharraf had developed a strong bond between them. Many al-Qaeda members were arrested. Not so the Taliban high command. Mullah Omar and his fellow fugitive leaders were reported to be living openly in the border city of Quetta. Right on the outskirts of Quetta, there is the biggest refugee camp, about 100,000 people. Now, this is the center of everything. And control the on the border. The center of the Taliban, 
Yeah. Yeah. Centers of anyone coming and going, any terrorist coming and any going. Any jihadi group. Yeah, anyone could come there and go. Can you differentiate between a Taliban or a refugee? No, sir, you cannot. They are the same, same beards, carrying weapons. So it's the same people. In Kabul, the Afghan intelligence service did not accept there was an innocent explanation to Mullah Omar's presence. From the outset, there was deep distrust of Pakistan's motives. The Taliban leadership were hibernating in Pakistan. They were not defeated or killed. The Americans received verbal assurances from President Musharraf that Pakistan will cooperate, but they kept the Taliban intact. I mean the leadership of the Taliban. I learned over time in dealing with President Musharraf that he would literally tell me the truth. Uh, I had an occasion when I asked him to dismantle a certain terrorist camp that was directed towards Kashmir. And after we wrangled a bit about it, he agreed. And he did he dismantle did. it? He did dismantle it. However, he remantled it a couple of kilometers away. So when I went back to him, I said, now, this time I've got to ask you to dismantle this terrorist camp. So let's say you have 12 in total. Tomorrow there'll be 11, and every day after this there'll be 11. Okay, I agree, and he did it. Terrorists who once occupied Afghanistan now occupy cells at Guantanamo Bay. Four months after 9-11, there was a feeling in Washington of mission accomplished. Liberated from the austerity of the Taliban regime, Afghans celebrated the birth of new freedoms, a free press, a role for women, and eventually the first democratically elected head of state. But the Americans had made it clear from the start that they weren't there to rebuild Afghanistan. That was a job for Hamid Karzai's new government. The US insisted that public safety in Afghanistan should be a responsibility for the Afghans, despite the fact that at this point the country had no army and no police force. The US Defense Secretary, Donald Rumsfeld, said it would be a fool's errand to get more involved in a tribal society as complex as Afghanistan. Rumsfeld said US forces would use their influence to prevent outright fighting, uh, but that nobody would do peacekeeping or public security outside Kabul. Britain led the first group of international forces to assist with the security of Kabul. That left 80% of the country at more than twice the size of the UK unsecured. Who did Secretary Rumsfeld think then was going to keep law and order if it wasn't going to be a, a, a stabilization? My, my view is he did not care. How did he imagine? Uh, that uh, stability was going to arise out of a... I don't think, I don't think he cared about stability. He, he was intent, and give him his credit, on, on, uh, on dismantling and destroying al-Qaeda. Mm. Uh, I don't think he was uh, intent at all on what the Afghan of the future, the Afghanistan of the future would look like. It's generally right not to put ourselves in the business of trying to govern a very foreign country for which we had neither the cultural nor the linguistic capacity to do it and which would have dragged us into Afghanistan, Afghan quarrels, and pretty soon we would be the problem, not as an occupying power, but it's beyond our competence. On the other hand, I think we should have done more to build up the Afghan capability to provide for their own security. security force. If there's one thing I would wish we had done, it was to use the time when things are relatively quiet. Karzai had no militia of his own. His interim government, brokered by the UN, included warlords, the same people whose violence and corruption had given rise to the Taliban. While they occupied cabinet seats in Kabul, their militias filled the power vacuum outside. People forget that he didn't create this administration. We did, with the international community, uh, including the United Nations, including myself. We formed this government. And we told him, please come to Kabul and lead this group. We allied ourselves with former warlords, and our uh, objective was to destroy al-Qaeda. 
and we very much then created and empowered a, a group of uh, political actors not accountable and also uh, people who as they grew in power actually caused more instability. In all this, the Taliban, who just months earlier had been the government of Afghanistan, seemed to have just vanished. I was one of the people who was saying, look, where are the Taliban? They, you know, these people controlled 90% of, of the country a few weeks ago. And what was the response? Uh, the response was, it's useless. You said, they have been defeated, it's gone, finished, they will never come back. Within six months of the invasion, Britain and America began to avert their gaze from Afghanistan, preoccupied by another matter. Preparations for the war in Iraq. The biggest single mistake, just one, probably Iraq. We didn't know then. The most important player in Afghanistan to the Americans was absent minded from day one, was looking somewhere else. The world was now focused almost exclusively on Iraq, while Taliban gunmen started to cross the porous border into southern Afghanistan. It was March 2003 just 18 months after the invasion, the Taliban were back. The Taliban went into to Kandahar um, and they were looking for targets. And, you know, there were very few targets. I mean, who, you know, there were just Afghans living there. There were no foreign troops there. There were a few Afghan government representatives who really weren't worth killing as far as the Taliban were concerned in those early days. So the Taliban just went further and further in to Afghanistan looking for targets. The United Nations in Afghanistan has ordered its staff not to travel by road through the area where an international Red Cross worker was murdered last Thursday. He was ordered out of his car by a group of armed men and then shot. You had American generals sending off cables saying, you know, something is happening, sending cables even to Rumsfeld. And I think Rumsfeld ignored them. The White House ignored them. We clearly have moved from major combat activity to a period of, of stability and stabilization and reconstruction and uh, activities. It was the forgotten war of 2002 to 2005. The Taliban were reorganizing. They were licking their wounds and figuring out what to do next. There wasn't a heavy British or coalition loss, and the country seemed to be relatively stable. It wasn't a war on the front pages. And yet, the Afghan war was far from over. In fact, it was about to reignite. By 2005, NATO was in control and did what Washington had so opposed at the start. They increased troop numbers and inched towards nation building. NATO wanted to extend the authority of the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai, beyond Kabul. Britain took on Helmand province. It was suggested that I should go down to this place called Lashkagar. And uh, everybody said, look, it's, it's not entirely safe, but you'll be OK. Boarding an old Russian helicopter, Britain's Foreign Office Minister decided to take a look for himself at Lashkagar, capital of Helmand province. And as we came into Lashkagar, uh, I, I saw down below me uh, this bulgest fort. The commander was, was a guy called Colonel Hogberg. I said, what's it like here? And he said, well, sir, it ain't the end of the earth, but you can see it from here. He said, you could be wandering into a fight between two tribes or sub-tribes or villages over water rights. You could run into a, uh, a drugs convoy. 
and, and he pointed out to me some of these drugs columns actually had anti-aircraft missiles on them. You could be running into Taliban or just a village that didn't like strangers. He said, we don't hang around because you never know who's shooting at you. I mean, this, this really struck me at the time as being a, an observation we ought, we ought to take a bit of notice of. Helmand had little infrastructure, few public services, no functioning security, economy, or justice system. The Blair government's vision for Helmand, however, did not lack for ambition. The original vision was that uh, Karzai would be able to create a growing and sustainable peace, and that this would create a space in which governance would, would spread. And some people likened this to creating, uh, creating Belgium in a couple of years. A team of experts was dispatched to Helmand by Whitehall in late 2005. Their task was to plan the delivery of this vision with troops providing protection and expected home in just three years. It was a task of biblical proportions. It was a medieval province, vast open spaces. There was no infrastructure. I remember flying across the province's only road. Corruption ran from top to bottom. So when one looked at all of this, one saw a, a rudderless expanse of not much, uh, where the principal economy uh, was drugs. Some estimates said that 80% of the population were illiterate, and that extended to many key functions in government, including the, the director of education, uh, who could not read or write. We didn't know how many police stations there were, and the chief of police wasn't really sure either. Uh, there were sporadic outbursts of violence um, because of the drug trafficking. And when I asked the American officer what background research I should do to understand Helmand a little better, he said I should watch The Sopranos. On their return home for Christmas, the planners met up with their Whitehall masters. The planners told them their vision for Helmand was unrealistic. The overwhelming impression I had of that afternoon was of the clock ticking. The conclusion that um, that this was not achievable in three years uh, was, not, was not an acceptable conclusion. There was uh, an unforgiving timeline and there was no time for discussion. The planners were told to get on with it, but they weren't the only ones asking awkward questions. The Foreign Office Minister wrote to the Ministry of Defence. We had planned to go down there with 3,300 troops um, we had 30,000 in Northern Ireland. Are we sure that, that we're going to be able to do something about this? And, and have we got enough helicopters? Have we got enough water? Can we, you know, can we do all of this? The general said yes, yes, and yes. The military momentum was unstoppable. Britain was going to Helmand, come what may. 16 Air Assault was the brigade chosen to provide protection for the reconstruction mission. They did anticipate some fighting. There was an awful lot of grenade launcher practice going on down the ranges. <laughs> um, and there wasn't much of a cue for the development brief. There are a lot of stripped down vehicles going past with 50 cows on the top. This was, I think, every soldier's dream, Afghanistan. Hugely historically resonant, extraordinary country, classic soldiering. Perhaps as a former soldier myself, I, I understand that. My sense was that they had come with a larger place in the plan for malleting the Taliban. No, I mean, I dispute that. I mean, I. I'd been in the military for two dozen years. I'd been on a lot of operations. I knew the consequences of, of the, the wrong use of force. I'd been in Afghanistan twice before. The force deployed gave a maximum of only 800 fighting soldiers. So the reconstruction mission was limited to the central area of Helmand around the capital, Lashkar Out on patrol in Helmand, the British troops have arrived and are introducing themselves to their new neighbours. Good, fine, thank you. How are you? 
Does he understand why the British soldiers are in Lash Gough? It's perfect. No, sir. He doesn't know. From the moment that troops arrived, Hellman's Afghan governor warned that his authority was being undermined by lawless gunmen in the north. He urged the army to deal with them. His argument was very much in case saying, I need you to make sure that the flag of Afghanistan flies over all of the district centers. Yeah, did you resist that to begin with or not? We did. We made it very clear that we were going to be extremely limited in our capability to do other operations. The generals in London judged that deploying north was unsustainable. But the Hellman governor persevered and was supported by the British Embassy in Kabul and the Secret Intelligence Service. By late May, the generals relented. The order was given to defend positions up to 70 miles from the reconstruction area. By late June, the army was thinly spread across three new flashpoints and about to stretch to yet a fourth, the town of Sangin. There were no angels in Sangin. There were two warring drug cartels, effectively, in Sangin. And here we were, about to deploy British troops in between those two drug cartels. Uh, I did everything I possibly could to, to engage anyone who had decision-making authority to say, this is, this is madness, this cannot be happening. But it was. The arrival of the troops stirred up a hornet's nest. I was furious uh, watching that, that type of decision-making that ended up um, uprooting the, the entire plan that we'd devised. The summer of 2006, saw the British Army engaged in some of its fiercest fighting in half a century. Watch it shoot! Watch it shoot! Pass up the pillars! How does this compare to Iraq? Oh, it's a lot worse. A lot, yeah, it's a lot better. We didn't see any action in Iraq. About eight, it's more or less every day can guarantee small arms fire incoming, like. Pinned down in a series of Alamos across the north of Helmand, British soldiers became magnets for attacks from the Taliban, drug gangs, and locals just angry at the presence of foreigners. A lot of the people we were killing were effectively the farmers who had, had AK-47s put in their hands by the Taliban leadership. Part-time Talibs, really? Part-time Talibs. Um, Part-time Talibs are not, are not very well-trained ones, and we killed huge numbers of them. And I don't think that was to our liking at all. And we were conscious that really for every one we killed, we were probably actually fueling the insurgency. The general responsible for overseeing day-to-day -day operations in Helmand was Sir Peter Wall, now head of the British Army. The mission changed dramatically. No, I don't think the mission did change, actually. Really? No. It changed in, in what, do you mean the, the aim changed? Or well, the well, mode of delivery changed? Well, it changed in the sense that the original mission was a sort of hearts and minds will help bring governance mission to this limited area in the center of Helmand. And within a matter of weeks, uh, 16 air assault were fighting for their lives in a series of Alamos, and no governance, none at all, taking place. Had we not gone north, what would have happened in your estimation? Uh, that's not for me to say. What, you're, you were, the, well, you, you, you uh, were in charge of the <clears throat> operational think, decision. Yeah. So what's your estimation? I think Afghan governance in Helmand would have collapsed. I think you'd have seen the Taliban breaking out um, and you'd have had your Alamos in different parts of Helmand. The original mission was to win hearts and minds. You would accept, I guess, that if only because we needed to protect our soldiers, um, that quite a lot of Afghan hearts were lost in the process. Undoubtedly. Yeah, undoubtedly. I accept that. This guy's ID in these here and saying the Taliban. Yeah, there was a room there. Yeah? Two men. Yeah, there. Taliban, yeah? How much of your original plan did you manage to implement? Not really very much. <laughs> 
I think after the first 18 months of hard fighting, uh, understanding the challenges that the Taliban posed, our expectations changed from Belgium in two years to Bangladesh in 30. Uh, the, the scale of the challenges really became apparent. Jesus! Stay still! Stay fucking still! Fuck with Bus! Bus, we gotta get him out now! In the first five years of the Afghan conflict, two British soldiers had been killed in action. In 2006 alone, that rose to 39. A slow drumbeat of death began to roll. Ministers said the sacrifice was about keeping the streets of Britain safe by denying Al-Qaeda a safe haven in Afghanistan. And yet a mission that had been intended to help stabilize Afghanistan seemed to have made it less stable. There's no doubt that the Taliban are growing in confidence and they're focusing their attention nowadays on Kabul. Well, another bomb blast on the streets of Kabul. This is something that's becoming increasingly familiar. By the start of 2007, violence had spread across much of the country with a seven-fold increase in suicide bombings. Many were being planned and executed from Pakistan. The then US commander was General Carl Eikenbury. He had regular meetings with the Afghan president, Hamid Karzai. Many of my conversations with him uh, were conversations of maybe 60 minutes, and 58 minutes would be spent on Pakistan. And my view was, initially, he seems to be obsessing on this subject. But I have to uh, tell you, as I look back on it, no, he was absolutely correct. It was a very serious problem. I think around that time, Pakistan came to the conclusion that maybe the coalition was going to be short of breath. I believe very strongly that if the coalition was not going to prevail in Afghanistan, then Pakistan wanted to make sure that they had some seat at the table. A seat for Pakistan by using the Taliban to gain influence inside Afghanistan. The CIA concluded that America's closest ally in the region could no longer be trusted. Pakistan's intelligence service, the ISI, was playing a double game. You want to know where the headquarters of the Afghan Taliban is? Find the headquarters of the ISI. They're in the same building. We've even had reports of Pakistani officers being killed inside Afghanistan fighting with the Afghan Taliban as expert advisors to them. The Afghans also insist that Pakistan intelligence was protecting the Taliban leader, Mullah Omar. They know where he is? Of course, they are, he is in their safe house. Did they ever tell you where he was when you were? I told them where he was and they got panicked, not once, not twice, time and again. Why did you not hand over Mullah Omar to the he Americans? He never came to Pakistan. Uh, he did. That is the normal belief. He came to Pakistan at the end of 2002. No, I don't think so, ever. You don't I think don't he's even there today? No, never. I don't think he'll be mad if he's in Pakistan. Where do you think he is? He will be in his own area because he dominates the area. What, in Afghanistan? Yes. You uh, think Mullah Rome is in Afghanistan? Yes, indeed. Absolutely. You must be the only person who does. Well, uh, only person, no. The, the people who don't believe that is probably West and United States. Uh, I don't think anyone else believes that he's in Pakistan. By the end of 2008, many of the Bush administration's major goals for Afghanistan were in reverse. The light military footprint was heavier, 53,000 NATO troops, mostly American, and rising. Washington, once determined to avoid nation building, now spending many billions. And Pakistan, once their friend, was betraying them. America was getting sucked in deeper and deeper, and there seemed no way out. All eyes turned to a new president for fresh thinking. Thank you so much, everybody. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We meet at one of those defining moments, a moment when our nation is at war. Our we left him a very poor hand uh, of cards uh, with uh, very few choices. Uh, when Mr. Obama came aboard, uh, he was uh, immediately faced with, be careful, don't lose Afghanistan. The president asked me to fly with him to California in early March 2009, and after reading my report, we then spent the better part of a couple of hours going through it. President Obama had asked Bruce Riddell to write a no-holes-barred report on the Afghan crisis, and Riddell did not pull his punches. Defeat is what we were staring in the eye two years ago, catastrophic defeat in Afghanistan, with the Taliban taking over the southern half of the country and maybe being able to march on Kabul at some point in the future, and the NATO alliance fragmenting and falling apart. The president ordered his staff to go back to basics. What exactly were America's goals and how best to achieve them? A grueling policy review ensued. It would take eight long months. In setting somewhat humbler than Air Force One, an equally bleak picture had been briefed to the British Prime Minister. I was on my way home for the weekend, and, um, and I got to Cardiff Station and Jess got on the train that goes up the valley, and it was packed out. And uh, suddenly the Prime Minister was on the phone, and you can't not take a call from the Prime Minister. Gordon Brown wanted Kim Howells's assessment of the Afghan government led by Hamid Karzai. Seven years earlier, Karzai had been seen as Afghanistan's savior. I told him that we would find it increasingly difficult trying to argue the case for continued death and, and the maiming of, of, our, of our young people in Afghanistan when they were fighting to prop up a regime that was basically up to its eyeballs in corruption. These mansions had sprung up in a part of Kabul exclusively reserved for Afghanistan's military and political elite. Ordinary Afghans could only wonder how such luxuries could be afforded on a government wage. In early 2009, one of the US senators overseeing America's multi-billion dollar investment in Afghanistan confronted Karzai in the presidential palace. The corruption in the country is rampant. Uh, very frustrating to go there year in and year out and say, when is somebody going to jail in Afghanistan for ripping off the Afghan people? When is somebody connected to the highest narcotics dealer ever going to go to jail in this country? You said uh, this to the pre uh, President Absolutely, Carson. just like I'm saying it to you. At the dinner table, yes, state dinner table. Yes, how much longer are we going, the Afghan people going to have to wait and the, and the world going to have to wait? Do you see things change here? <laughs> This is Afghan MP Dr. Basha Dost, famous for giving most of his salary to the poor. In 2004, he resigned as Karzai's planning minister in protest at the epic scale of corruption. Karzai offered to let Basha Dost head a new anti-corruption commission. He agreed, but only if he could investigate Karzai's cabinet. I said to Mr. Karzai, we must start it to find the corruption in the staff of ministry, in the staff of presidential palace, in the Supreme Court. What was his response? He refused. He refused that I start the corruption in top level of Afghan state. It was the reason that he didn't accept my condition. So you left the government? I left the government. In August 2009, Karzai stood for re-election. Voting is underway in Afghanistan's presidential election. Corruption, fraud, apathy, and the threat of attacks on the Taliban. The allegations of vote rigging and fraud have been ringing across the cities, the valleys, and the plains of Afghanistan. 
The presidential election was wreathed in corruption. Ballot boxes were stuffed with false papers. The campaigns of both frontrunners were implicated. Karzai won a second term in office. But for the West, it meant five more years with a partner who'd become a liability and whose state of mind was also ringing alarm bells. President Karzai said to me several times that he suspected uh, the British Army was involved in the drugs trade in Helmand, otherwise we could have ended it. He was sure that if we really wanted to, we could defeat the Taliban in Helmand, and we were choosing to keep the fighting going in order to give us an excuse to be there. I mean, it's an extraordinary paranoia. Afghanistan was beginning to look like just another tin pot dictatorship. In America, on the 1st of December 2009, the president announced the results of his long-awaited Afghan review. I want to speak to you tonight about our effort in Afghanistan and the strategy that my administration will pursue to bring this war to a successful conclusion. Increasingly brazen After years of drift, America seemed to set its compass. It was getting out of Afghanistan, but not before having one last crack at the Taliban. If I did not think that the security of the United States and the safety of the American people were at stake in Afghanistan, I would gladly order every single one of our troops home tomorrow. To reverse the Taliban's momentum, the generals told the president there'd need to be a military surge. The president sent another 30,000 troops to war. This has taken the total number of troops in Afghanistan to 142,000. What you do, what you do today, you're going to live with that shit for the next 10, 20, 30 plus years. This president decided that once in, he was in all the way, and that he needed to give our commanders in Afghanistan the troops they felt necessary in order to turn the situation around. For the first time, we had, if you like, the, the, the end state quantified in military terms. Mm. Uh, up until then, we'd just been increasing uh, bit by bit with never any clue of when enough was going to be enough. The Americans decided that to secure Helmand, 30,000 troops were needed. The most Britain could supply was 10,000. If the Americans hadn't gone into Helmand, there would have been a strategic defeat for the British Army. Well, there would have been um, an inability to get our strategic objectives secured because the force levels that were required were beyond us. I mean, that's not, I think, quite the same as a strategic defeat for the British Army. It's a strategic defeat for NATO, but the British Army would have done its job magnificently. The purpose of the surge is to clear ground held by the Taliban. Smoke it! Get bitch! Oh, yeah, baby! I fucking love you. Do it right, Jack. The Americans want to hand over the whole of Afghanistan to Afghan security forces by 2015. When the surge was announced, the British Foreign Secretary and his special envoy thought this was wildly ambitious. We asked um, a very senior Afghan minister how long uh, the Afghan authorities would stay in Helmand after we left. And um, the Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, was expecting the answer three years, six years, you know, however long it took. Uh, and the answer from this minister, very close to President Karzai, who knows Helmand very well, his answer with a broad grin was 24 hours, Foreign Secretary, 24 hours. The Americans say that since then, there's been much progress from a $12 billion a year training program. Yet they're building an Afghan army and police force whose cost neither they nor the Afghans can sustain. And corruption and drug taking are still endemic, even while on guard duty. Ultimately, as long as the Afghan government lacks legitimacy with the overwhelming majority, its security forces may not be able to hold the Taliban at bay. At the end of the day, if you're going to follow a counterinsurgency strategy, 
you must be true to its precept. And one of the principal precepts is, in a counterinsurgency, you're only as good as the government you represent and serve. And in this case, it's the government of Afghanistan. That is why the Americans say that US troops will only be withdrawn from combat by 2015 if the Afghans are capable by then of taking over, not so the British. In May last year, Britain got a new leader. Like the president, the prime minister says he too will withdraw combat forces by 2015. I believe the country needs to know there is an end point to all of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from 2015, there will not be troops in anything like the numbers there are now, and crucially, they will not be in a combat role. Unlike the American president, however, the prime minister intends to withdraw from combat by 2015, whether or not Afghan forces can prevent al-Qaeda returning to Afghanistan, even though that's always been the justification for our soldiers dying there. If the assessment, as at the end of 2014, is that Afghanistan hasn't been hardened against the return of al-Qaeda, might that deadline have to slip? No, the deadline is a deadline, and it won't slip. We have paid a very, very large price in terms of the number of young men and, indeed, some young women that we've lost in Afghanistan, now over 360 people. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're going to maintain public support and backing for what we're doing, it's important to give people a clear idea that there is an end to this. There are lots of domestic political reasons why the Prime Minister has selected uh, that option. And we have committed ourselves as the British Army to uh, deliver against that timeline. Mm. Well, and whether or not it turns out to be an absolute timeline or a more conditions-based approach nearer the time, we shall find out. Ah, so it's, it, 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 it's, it's not an absolute commitment, then? that we will get out of combat operations irrespective of the conditions on the ground? It's certainly the intention. The intention, yeah. But things could change. Well, things could always change. I mean, uh, things change weekly in politics, in, in strategic issues. For some time, Britain's special representative to Afghanistan had been arguing the only way out was to start talking to the Taliban. Last summer, Sherard Cooper Coles attended a summit of Afghan experts at Chequers, hosted by David Cameron. Stabilizing Afghanistan isn't a question uh, of pumping in more and more troops or training up a vast national army to garrison the country. It's uh, creating, arriving at a political settlement and then using military force to underpin that settlement, but not to deliver it. The simple conclusion that we came to is that uh, most insurgencies down history and around the world have ended in, in two ways. One with some military success, but secondly, uh, with some political process and solution as well. The new prime minister decided it was time to take political risks to start talking to the Taliban. Last February, Washington agreed, something they'd previously opposed. The Americans say a Taliban team, including an aide to the leader Mullah Omar, are now engaged in exploratory talks. Whilst American officials are talking to the Taliban, American special forces are also seeking out and killing many individual Taliban commanders. In a typical 90-day period, special mission units kill or capture some 360 targeted insurgent leaders. The Americans say that only this relentless lethal pressure will persuade the Taliban to negotiate seriously. The Taliban say the only outcome will be yet more attacks directed at coalition forces. They consider that the, the continuance of war in this country is not in the benefit of their people. And, uh, but in practice, they are using their military policies, military operations against the Taliban. They are 
forcing Taliban to, to go towards the military, um, uh, to military response. On a moonless night last month, American special forces set course for Pakistan. Their target, Osama bin Laden, the man the Taliban leadership still revere as the leader of the Islamic Jihad against the infidel invaders. On nights like this one, we can say to those families who have lost loved ones to Al-Qaeda's terror, justice has been done. I couldn't be more proud. It's been a long 10 years. The Americans may have removed bin Laden from the scene, but what of his original objectives? The objective of September 11th was to goad the United States into invading Afghanistan. Then they could destroy an American army in Afghanistan shatter our will at home and lead the United States and our allies to get out of the Islamic world. Bin Laden did provoke the longest war in America's history, and the financial cost has become unsustainable, never mind the human toll. <laughs> You're going to say that we kill your women and your children, and that's not true. So what about the coalition's war objectives? They say they've dismantled al-Qaeda's base in Afghanistan, but it's been remantled across the border in Pakistan. We have not succeeded yet in partnering of the state of Afghanistan to ensure that al-Qaeda cannot return here. Ten years ago, we thought we could get in and out quickly. Today, we're still struggling to build an Afghan government that can stand on its own two feet. And now, we're losing patience. I mean, I think no one really understood, perhaps still no one really does understand, the scale of the challenge we've taken on in Afghanistan. Um, we would never, in the 19th century, have created a colony run it for five or ten years and then said it's over to you now. But that's really what our so-called strategy in Afghanistan is. If it's going to take 30 years to stabilize Afghanistan, let the Afghans go through those 30 years of stabilization, because we will never do it. We have not 30 years, but just three years to get it finally right. The armies of the international coalition are all heading for the exits. Next week, Mark Urban tells the inside story of the bloody five-year battle for Hellman with unique access to the generals and frontline troops who've had to fight him. And our series of programmes marking 10 years since the invasion of Afghanistan continues next Wednesday at 9 with the battle for Hellman.